Back in 1995, I moved with my family to live next door to an old red brick Edwardian house in Lancaster Avenue, Hadley Wood, called Rookstone. To the right of the porch is a blue plaque bearing the simple inscription, William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, lived here from 1903 until his death on 20th of August 1912. Since then, I have longed to know more about the story of the man behind the plaque, but I found almost nothing locally. So I delved into the archives of the Salvation Army, Barnet Museum and several biographies. What I found is amazing, so I'm really pleased to share it with you in this presentation. General William Booth was a veritable legend in his time, probably the first and certainly the greatest celebrity ever to have lived in Hadley Wood, which was his home for over 20 years. He was the Victorian equivalent of Billy Graham, in uniform. There is so much material about him that I can only begin to scratch the surface, but if the presentation which follows leads to a better understanding of what this remarkable man did, who he was, where he lived, and the Christian faith which drove him on to greatness, it will have achieved its purpose. Since classical times, a warrior's greatness has been reflected in the scale of his funeral, and so it was with General Booth. And therefore, I will begin his story at the end of his life. On the afternoon of 20th August 1912, a dramatic thunderstorm broke over Hadley Wood. Then a calm descended. And at 30 minutes past 10 o'clock that evening, in Rookstone, an elderly gentleman with a long white beard, tussled white hair and a curved nose, which many people fondly said resembled that of the late Duke of Wellington, breathed his last. William Booth was 83 years of age. Two days later, at around 10 o'clock in the evening, a handful of neighbours gathered outside Rookstone. They saw a casket being carried gently down the stairs, through the porch, down the path in a small, silent procession, and into the waiting hearse. A senior Salvation Army officer was kneeling in prayer on the drive. Two police constables were present. Then the car drove off into the night to Clapton, quietly, without fuss, bearing away the mortal remains of William Booth as the rear red light disappeared at the bend of the road. This newsreel clip picks up the story a week later. On the 20th of August 1912, William Booth, God's soldier, laid down his sword. He lay in state in the Congress Hall, London. Thousands came to pay tribute. For the last time, he leaves the Army Headquarters in Queen Victoria Street. Through the streets of London, his funeral procession passed through the city of which he was freeman. The flags of nations invaded by the army were carried proudly at the head of the column. The whole traffic of this metropolis was arrested by one of the densest multitudes that ever thronged its thoroughfares. As the carriage passed the mansion house, the Lord Mayor of London saluted the coffin. Ten thousand men and women from the ranks of the Salvation Army, specially selected to represent their comrades, walked behind their promoted leader who had taught them to give their lives ministering to the poorest, the lowliest and the lost. 
world recognized that with the passing of this man, one of its great fighters had passed away. Messages of sympathy rained in from every quarter of the globe. Every newspaper of any consequence paid its tribute. No man ever finished his Earth's battle with so universal a triumph. He passed to his burial in Abney Park Cemetery, London. The vast crowd that witnessed the end of his last journey was symbolic of a mightier host. For in the shelters of the army he had founded, thousands of homeless men were finding refuge. In his homes, thousands of women, saved from the uttermost ruin, were mourning his loss. In every continent, many there were, telling each other sorrowfully that the father who had sought them out and rescued them had passed from the world. And in countries as ancient as China and as new as America, tens of thousands were speaking of him as the man who had brought them comfort and strength. And so William Booth was laid to rest. Our story now takes us back 83 years to April 1829, when William Booth was born in a poor part of Nottingham called Snenton. He later recalled happy days playing in crocus fields and angling for fish in the Trent. But in reality, young William's childhood was far from happy. This is how he described his father, a local self-made builder. My father was a grab and get. He had been bred in poverty. He was determined to grow rich, and he did. He grew very rich. Because he lived without God and simply worked for money, when he lost it all, his heart broke, and he died miserably. And how hard his childhood was. His father had made a pile of money and then lost it all. So, at the tender age of 13, William was taken out of school and apprenticed to a local pawnbroker. A few months later, his father died, leaving his mother to scrape a living in selling toys, needles and cotton. And so it was that in the people who entered the shabby pawnbroker's shop and lived in the nearby slums of Nottingham, young William came face to face with a terrible contradiction of Victorian society. For many, this was a society which was supremely self-confident, prosperous and powerful, as we see in this painting by Franz Winterhalter of Queen Victoria and her family. But on the other side of the canvas, with no welfare state to provide a safety net, the poorest one-tenth of the population of England, say three million people, were submerged in abject destitution, treated less humanely than a London cab horse. As William Booth later remarked, the London cab horse was better cared for than the urban poor. At least it had stables for shelter, corn for food, work to do, and people to pick it up from the cobbles when it stumbled. The average life expectancy of a family in the labouring classes was 22 to 25. The smiles here are deceptive. Life in the Victorian slums was too often nasty brutish and short. If you were a child, you were lucky if you lived to see your fifth birthday. The fetid, unsanitary, crowded slums were a breeding ground for smallpox, cholera, TB and vice, fueled too often by the scourge of drink. By the 1890s, on average 200,000 were arrested each year for drunkenness and a 24-7 culture of drinking prevailed. See this beer house in the Whitechapel Road, where drink is being sold through an open window. Alcohol abuse ruined marriages and devastated lives, etched on the faces of three habitual drunkards banned from the pubs of Birmingham. Then there was the scandal of the workhouse, where in textile mills, children as young as 14 were put to work on cleaning machinery 
while it was still running, while other children worked on shucking oysters, the poor man's meal. The plight in particular of women and children was acute because they were the economic and social underclass of society, and so prostitution, and in particular child prostitution, flourished in the alleyways and dark places. Made easier by the age of consent being only 13, until with the help of lobbying from the Salvation Army, it was raised to 16 in 1885. As for the prisons, the policy was to keep prisoners away from human company in solitary confinement. Here we see prisoners in the exercise yard in Pentonville with their faces masked. No policy to rehabilitate them, just bang them up. And convicts in adult prisons were too frequently juveniles. Here is James Donnelly, a teenager, sentenced to two months in prison for stealing shirts. So it is no surprise that the young William Booth was deeply moved by what he saw in the slums of Nottingham and the sad trail of people visiting the pawn shop where he worked. At around the same age as James Donnelly, at the age of 15, William became a Christian. He asked God's forgiveness for everything that was wrong with his life and accepted Jesus as Saviour and Lord. This is how he described his conversion. I was in the open street outside the Wesley Chapel in Nottingham that this great change passed over me. His life had changed from serving himself to serving God and others. He then made a promise to God saying, God shall have all there is of William Booth. And then he did something very practical, which speaks volumes about William Booth in later life. He put his new faith into action. William owned a silver pencil case, which he had taken from a friend under false pretenses. He sought out the friend, admitted his wrongdoing, apologised and returned the pencil case. The general later in life recounted how his bosom companion, a lovely young man called Will Sansom, invited him to join him in street preaching in the slums of Nottingham and caring for the sick and dying in the evenings. And so William preached his first sermon in 1846. Will Samson died shortly afterwards of consumption, a massive blow to William, but he didn't turn back. As a young man, he was ordained as a Methodist minister, then travelled all over England preaching and finally moved to London where, in 1855, he married Catherine Mumford. She was the earthly love of his life. From the tender correspondence passing between them, it's clear that this was a true love match and that William and Catherine were soulmates from the start. Catherine was a remarkable and highly intelligent woman who was an enormous influence for good on William. A committed Christian, she worked with alcoholics, started campaigns to help the poor and needy, and on top of all that, bore him eight children. She believed passionately in equality for women, and from all accounts was a powerful preacher herself, a courageous thing to do in those days. And importantly, more than any other person, having had an education herself, she helped to shape William's theology and social conscience. Often with a very sharp wit. It will be a happy day for England when Christian ladies transfer their sympathies from poodles and terriers to destitute and starving children. One evening in 1865, the Reverend William Booth was preaching outside the Blind Beggar pub in the East End, and some Christians invited him to preach in a large old tent on the Quaker's burial ground nearby. It was then that he realised that his destiny was to preach God's message to poor people who didn't go to church each Sunday and were lost. And soon he formed his own Christian movement, the Christian Mission, which met at seven o'clock every evening to hear the gospel preached. He preached in the streets of the East End. My cathedral was the sky, 
I knew I could get at them, the poor people, if they would only listen. I was sure I could help them. And in a large ragged tent on the Quaker's burial ground. And as he was preaching, he realised that people would not listen to his message of God's love if they were cold and hungry. Oh, the sins and the sufferings and the pains and the griefs and the wickedness of London. It was hell. Hell. So, with the help of his son Bramwell, William Booth once again put his faith into action. He set up cheap food stores, shelters for the homeless to sleep in, and cheap breakfasts for poor children. An army of Christian volunteers was formed, and in 1878 the name of the Christian mission was changed to the Salvation Army. They almost chose Volunteer Army, but Booth struck through Volunteer and wrote Salvation. We are not volunteers, he said. We are regulars. What a wonderful modern piece of rebranding. He went on to say, we are salvation people. This is our speciality, getting saved and then getting somebody else saved. The heart of the Christian duty, having been saved, was to save others so that they can save others. From that moment, the Reverend William Booth became General Booth, God's general, in command of a uniformed army. It was Catherine who designed the flag and parts of the uniform. Here we see the crest, and on the crest the motto, Blood and Fire. This is not a reference to something to hellfire and damnation, although for General Booth, hell was a reality from which people had to be saved. No, Blood and fire points to the blood of Christ which brings salvation to sinners by washing them clean, and the fire of the Holy Spirit working in those who have been saved to live lives pleasing to God so that others might be saved. At the beginning of 1889, the Hadley Wood chapter opens, with the Booths moving home to the Crescent, Hadley Wood, from Stanford Hill, where they had lived for many years. Why did they move to the tiny hamlet which was then Hadley Wood? Well, I think the Victorian equivalent of a friendly Hadley Wood estate agent would have relied on three main plugs. First, the fresh air, countryside and seclusion of Hadley Wood. This was very important for Catherine, who had poor health and was fighting cancer, left undiagnosed for a long time until shortly before the move. Second, the station opened four years earlier with excellent transport links into King's Cross. This was important for the general and senior officers as the Salvation Army grew at home and overseas. Third, this was an excellent area to bring up families because of the range of good-sized houses recently built by Charles Jack on the Beech Hill Estate. This was perfect for the Booth adult children and their growing families, especially Bramwell, who was very close to his father and chief of staff of the army. Here we see, in a photo taken a few years later, a mother posing with her seven children outside the post office, Probably William Booth's daughter-in-law, Florrie, and her seven children, who will feature again in a moment. At the beginning of 1889, William and Catherine moved to 30 Crescent East, today called White Gables. This is how the General's move to Hadley Wood was reported in the local press. This will benefit from a little translation as we go along. Easter Holidays in Barnet it was fondly, although perhaps unreasonably, hoped that when, a few months ago, the head Salvationist, that's General Booth, came with his staff to live near us, in Hadley Wood, we might, through his powerful influence, see some diminution in the native loaferism of Barnet. Loaferism is another word for saying extreme idleness as well as a diminution of those unfragrant exotics that find their way here and blossom, though not flourish, in the artificial stimulus of our pothouses. Our pothouses have nothing to do with 
what Amsterdam is famous for, but mean, in those days, Barnet pubs and taverns. The article goes on to say that the general will find plenty of recruits for his army in this area. So, if the general will but come and enlist the whole lot, he will earn the everlasting gratitude of Barnet. Here you can see one of the first letters written by the general from Hadley Wood in July 1889 to a Mr Crosley, a supporter of the army. At the other end of the Crescent, in Crescent West, here we see where it joins Camlick Way, there were new semi-detached homes for two sons. 55 Crescent West, into which Bramwell and his wife Florence, or Flory, moved. It must have been a bit of a squeeze, if the 1991 census is anything to go by, with 11 people living there on the census day. They had seven children, whom we've already seen in the photo, in addition two domestic staff and two visitors. Bramwell became the army's chief of staff and was known as the chief, and Flory lived in Hadley Wood until 1949. Well, next door, at 53 Crescent East, lived Bramwell's younger brother, Herbert, and his Dutch wife, Cornelie. They moved in after the general married them in 1890. Herbert was a talented musician, but the semi-detached arrangement wasn't the best idea, since the two brothers didn't get on. And so, Herbert and Cornelie moved to Canada in 1892. William and Catherine didn't live long at their new home in Hadley Wood before personal disaster struck. You will remember that Catherine was ill, one of the reasons for moving to Hadley Wood. By August 1889, her condition had deteriorated and she decided to move to a Salvation Rest home in, on Clacton-on-Sea, a place by the seaside which she loved, and William followed her. In October 1890, Catherine died. William lost the love of his life, and according to Roy Hattersley in his biography of William Booth, England lost one of the greatest women of the Victorian age. She was known as the mother of the Salvation Army. Among Catherine's memorable quotations is this. Salvation that does not lead to service is no salvation at all. Another powerful way of saying that faith without good deeds is dead and that the mark of salvation is to serve God and others as Christ would have. St James would have approved. In 1891, William Booth moved back to Hadley Wood to live on the other side of Crescent East in Homestead. As you can see, it was a fine large house with a long wide garden going down to Lancaster Avenue and including an apple orchard. The general must have rattled around a bit inside with only his domestic servants and his personal secretary for company. While Catherine was ill in Clacton, in the next room to her bedroom, William had penned a bestseller, a visionary book called In Darkest England and the Way Out. Almost 250,000 copies were sold, and it became the talking point of the turn of the decade. This was the general's vision of how, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God, a highway to heaven through darkest England. In a nutshell, William outlined his grand plan for helping and rescuing the lost, as many as possible of the one-tenth of the population submerged in poverty. This was to be done by offering them work and shelter in a series of safe havens run by Salvationists, first in a city colony, then a country colony, and eventually an overseas colony. Progressive schemes for the betterment of the human condition. The grand plan is beautifully illustrated in this diagram, showing members of the Salvation Army pulling the lost people out of the raging ocean at the bottom and leading them up the road to material and spiritual salvation. We also see General Booth giving one of his many lectures on his schemes. To give practical help to the starving, the homeless, the unemployed, drunkards, paupers, criminals, prostitutes, slum dwellers, the sick, the lost, young girls and suicidals. William Booth was portrayed as the new Moses, leading the nation, including the Queen, 
the Prince of Wales Bertie and the whole establishment to a new promised land, what we might call a Victorian version of the welfare state. But it is important to realise that the General wasn't into politics, although he did call himself a Salvation Socialist. This is how he described himself. I am a socialist, a Salvation Socialist, and always have been. But that is not the same as Fabian Socialists, God bless them. I deal with the individual first. I want to make a new man of him, to save the man, and that saved individual will be a far better citizen for working out the schemes of your governmental socialism than an unsaved man. Here we see two examples of the Darkest England vision. In 1891, the Hadley Farm Colony was opened, and after a few months, 250 of the best urban wastrels had started a new life in the country. The same year, near Bow, a Salvation Match Factory was opened, paying a fair wage to its workers and using non-toxic red phosphorus, which didn't cause necrosis of the face, which happened to workers at other factories where cheaper red phosphorus was used. At the same time, other schemes were being developed for shelters, soup kitchens, refuges, homes, workplaces, and accompanied by stirring hymns and music to open windows into heaven. In 1894, the general moved to 32 Crescent East from Homestead, which was far too big for him, but a perfect size for his son Bramwell and Florence to bring up their family of seven children and put up visitors. So Bramwell and Florrie moved into Homestead and William moved across the road. That's how it is now and how it was then. And here it is as the general centre of operations from which he commanded the army with a rod of iron. We see a rather fine portrait of him in Vanity Fair the general never shied away from publicity, and one of his vast numbers of letters. We may not have many photos of him at 32 Crescent East, but have plenty of press reports of interviews which the general squeezed into his impossibly busy schedule. This is one of them, slightly condensed. He lives on the rare days when he is not travelling at Hadley Wood near Barnet in a red brick villa that is close to the station but distinguished from the others in the road by the poverty of its window curtains. As you can see, this is in contrast to the finest quality of window curtains today. In the sitting room, a young man with a blue serge raiment and brass collar letters of the Salvation Army and a Remington typewriter are the chief articles of furniture. The general works in a back room and sleeps above in an old-fashioned four-poster bed. As we enter the small, sparsely furnished sitting room, General Booth rises to receive us. A tall, gaunt figure clad in a dark blue dressing gown, edged with red, coming down to his heels, underneath a thick cloth waistcoat without buttons. He takes no exercise except on the station platform. At home he rises at six, prepares and drinks a cup of strong tea and sits down to his table and the labours of the day. He continues his writing, dictating and issuing of orders until 10 or 11 o'clock at night, then has a cold bath and goes to bed. But his secretary's duties are not over. Oh no, the general is a martyr to insomnia. And so his poor secretary often attends him with a notepad in hand in the wee small hours. Well, today we call him a dedicated workaholic, but every sinew directed to the good of others. He was a veggie, a non-smoker, and of course, strict teetotaler. He lived off endless strong cups of tea, lashings of bread and butter, parsnip mash, and good English apples, served by his grey-haired, devoted, saintly housekeeper, Francis Lancaster, Captain Lancaster, or often called simply just Lancaster. The General's rare days in Hadley Wood punctuated a diary of constant travelling. 
This map gives you an idea of the spread of the Salvation Army overseas, like prairie fire, to no less than 58 countries by the General's death. That is every part of the globe which is not coloured in grey on this map. He travelled to every continent by train and steamship practically every year, preaching, setting up local corps and motivating the army at home and overseas. Even in the year of his death, General Booth travelled to Norway. But he still had time for the small things of life. He wrote regular letters to his dear old housekeeper. Lancaster, he writes in a letter from Cape Town in 1905, look after the house and see the gardens are done as I desire. Make sure they put in the trees and do the grass in the autumn and don't put it off till the spring. And please pray for me and look after your soul. Yours faithfully, W.B. General. To celebrate this global influence in 1894 and 1904, two grand international congresses were held in London to which were drawn Salvationists from every corner of the world. They were massive multimedia events attended by journalists, illustrators and photographers, and at the centre was the general. Here you see him preaching in his usual animated manner, and in a jubilee issue of the official publication called The War Cry, available in no less than 17 different languages. After the move to Hadley Wood, the army was very much on the offensive against the evils of drink. In this issue of The War Cry, we see a gun that needs spiking to put an end to the little demon we see having a drink in the background. This triggered a violent reaction from a coalition of brewers, publicans and those who hated what the Salvation Army stood for. Opposition groups calling themselves skeleton armies were formed to intimidate and attack Salvationists. They threw bricks and rats at Salvation Army parades and triggered some dreadful riots in which Salvationists were injured and killed. General Booth and his children were sub subject to many violent attacks themselves. There was also opposition from the press and parts of the establishment that felt threatened, including the established church. The press were especially hostile, and here are some cartoons which lampooned the general mercilessly and unfairly. As a money grabber. Listen to this piece of fake news in an article published in the local press in October 1889. "'Tis very sad but very significant that the week of self-denial which our good friends of the Salvation Army observed did not extend to the superior ranks of the service. General Booth, if the usual voracious chroniclers of the metropolis tell true, that same week gave up a private residence in Hadley Wood, the rent of which was £120 per annum, and bought a house and in grounds at Potter's Bar for £4,000.' All of this totally untrue, of course. William Booth lived an extremely frugal life and in fact had moved to Clacton to be with his dying wife. He never drew a salary from the Salvation Army and the houses where he lived were rented. And here another cartoon, why not the Salvation Navy? And how about the Salvation free thinker and iconoclast going for the walls of Jericho? or the beggar's messiah leading his ragged flock into the countryside with the dogs of envy snapping at his heels. And not forgetting the Salvation Music Hall artiste. Or this cartoon in Punch in 1892 of the crazed political puppeteer pulling the strings of a Salvation House of Commons. The caption in the balloon what a good start, General. My, my, now for the Lords and the LCC. But General Booth was not deterred by the opposition, and he saw it off. Here we see him preaching in the same suit that he wore every year. He preached with every nerve, every muscle of his body. Not an orator in the mould of Cicero or Churchill, but his style was totally engaging. He was intense sometimes the patriarch, sometimes the statesman, sometimes the social wizard. He would use his long arms to emphasise a point. 
He spoke with passion and enormous nervous energy, often peppering his speech with personal anecdotes of people who had been brought to salvation. And like a footballer, he would applaud the crowd when they applauded him, clapping back. And he held people's attention for one hour, and sometimes two. What charisma. He was totally in control. Or almost. In 1903, he was preaching in Manchester in a packed assembly hall of 4,000. Explaining what happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, General Booth held his audience in the palm of his hand as he boomed, And fire fell from heaven! And fire fell from heaven! And the third time he exclaimed, And fire fell from heaven! And sure enough, fire did fall from heaven as an arc lamp fuse sending a shower of sparks down on the audience. A woman screamed, a man shouted, fire, fire, every man for himself, and panic set in as people rushed into the aisles to escape. Only the general's presence of mind prevented disaster. He started singing a hymn, ordered the band to strike up, and order returned. He later described this as the worst five minutes of my life. In 1903, the general moved to Rookstone in Lancaster Avenue, where a new and more comfortable house for a gentleman in his, in his 70s was specially built for him by the Salvation Army. The general never owned any of the houses in Hadley Wood. He now lived at the bottom of his son Bramwell's long, wide garden. Here is Rookstone as it was then. It was described by a journalist as a simple little house in the still, quiet and lovely park-like fields of Hadley Wood. Here is the house today, the small saplings planted in the General's day having grown to full height. We are told by one biographer how his seven grandchildren would run down the garden of their parents' home at Homestead to visit their grandfather for meals. They are described as merry grandchildren, shorthand for very lively since their parents were away a lot on army business. Neighbours described them less charitably as the screaming booths. Oh, one more thing about Bramwell Booth's garden. It had a large orchard with scrumptious apples for the general to eat. He was very partial to baked apples. It seems that two ancient apple trees survive to this day. Outside Rookstone we meet the postboy, who would have been kept very busy to cope with all the letters. On William Booth's birthdays, the post office had to take on extra staff to deal with the deluge of congratulatory telegrams. And we now move to the front door to be greeted by the General, his private secretary, Commissioner Theodore Kitching, and the General's faithful dog, Jip. Here's Jip as the centre of attention. And we go inside to the sitting room, furnished for the General's afternoon snooze. According to a journalist, he does not call it home. Since my dear wife died, I have no home, just a place where I keep some furniture. With his typical dry sense of humour, he called it not a bad little hole, with two decent light rooms, one for working and the other for sleeping in. Here was a haven where the general in his seventies could rest up and enjoy his coups of tea. Here was a corner of the world to die in. But his work ethic hadn't changed. After a gruelling International Congress, where he had addressed 53 meetings in a space of four weeks, a journalist asked him this question. Now you are going to rest, of course. To which Booth replied, Yes, in the way I always rest when I can, and that is by working. When asked about his good health and endurance, he offered seven rules for a long life. One, eat little. Two, drink water. Three, take exercise. It seems that the general was then in the habit of occasional strolls in Hadley Wood with his dog, between naps, work and travel. Four, have a system. Five, take pleasures wisely. 6. Avoid excesses of all kinds. And 7. Aim high. 
Here we enter the study at the back of his house, with a favourite picture on the wall entitled Women and Children First, depicting the rescue of passengers from a sinking ship, which for William Booth was the perfect picture of what the Salvation Army had to do for the lost and the outcasts, saving them from death in this life and beyond. And a drawing of the study. And the general at work with quill pen in hand. In addition to Colonel Kitching, there was a shorthand writer to attend to the general's dictation, and sometimes two. And looking in from outside, this is published in the London Illustrated News. With a view from the window across the long garden, full of flowers, to dip down to the Monkey Mead Brook, and then up to the ridge where Wagon Road runs, quintessentially English. In the garden with Chip and his beehives, the general developed one significant hobby in beekeeping. He sold to neighbours pots of honey to raise money for the Salvation Army's self-denial fund. He recalls in his journal one occasion when he was stung by a swarm of a hundred bees and had to take refuge in the house. Here we see him greeting a group of chiefs from Swaziland in his living room. Despite his age, Hadleywood was still a base for Booth's tireless work and a starting point for six famous motor tours across the length and breadth of Great Britain. This photo shows the general sitting in a 1910 Dirac, a well-respected French make which later became Talbot. A very old man, just turned 80, sitting in the latest newfangled car. Here is a close-up of father and son, the general and Bramwell, his chief of staff and future successor. And another of him with his granddaughter, Catherine Bramwell Booth. She lived to be 104 and became famous in her own right. Looking back at her childhood in Hadleywood, this is what she said. It was so perfect that I have never written about it as no one would ever believe me. Here is the general preaching from his car in Barnet Market. From 1904 to 1910, the general clocked up over 8,000 miles of motoring to spread the good news in villages, towns and hamlets and communities which couldn't be reached by train. Each tour lasted four to six weeks and ferried him to an average of three major speaking engagements each day at 11 o'clock in the morning, then early afternoon, and finally, eight o'clock in the evening. For an average of over one hour speaking at each engagement. This is how a visit to Scarborough was reported. The veteran chief of the Salvation Army rode into Scarborough with the spirit and freshness of a holidaymaker. Life in the open air and plenty of hard work do more for General Booth than doctors. The past nine days have been full of motoring and platform activities and General Booth has nearly a fortnight of the same kind of thing still before him. What stamina and determination, and this on top of his overseas travel. Now let's get the motor tour moving and look out for the gentleman waving at the crowds from his motor car. That's the General in his late 70s the ultimate performer. There were some people who disapproved of these methods. But on the whole, the imagination of the world was struck with sympathy and approval that this very old man should adopt the latest invention of science at the end of his life's work. <laughs> 
In town or country, large numbers gather to listen to him. For by now, William Booth, who had faced great opposition for so long, had in his old age achieved worldwide popularity. His work was recognized as the work of one honestly inspired by love of humanity. Campaigning by motor car soon became one of the general's established methods. In vehicles like these, he journeyed throughout England, Scotland and Wales. The going was not always without mishaps. A puncture in those days was apparently not very easy to deal with. And now a word from the general about the part music played. We are great believers in the Ministry of Music. We have bands all over the country, and the prison concert will be a red-letter day for all concerned. What we wanted to do, he said, was to use music as a means of touching the heart and rousing the better emotions of the soul. And how about this for friends in high places? The general had several private audiences with King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra, with King George V and Queen Mary while they were prince and princesses of Wales. In 1904, he records in his journal taking the 945 train from Hadley Wood to King's Cross and washing his hands in a workman's bucket in the Strand Hall before taking a cab to Buckingham Palace, where the king shook the hand that had been washed in the workman's bucket. And he was very well known by many other heads of state, including the kings of Norway and Denmark, the Queen of Sweden, the Emperor of Japan, and the Dowager Empress of Russia. Across the pond, where the army had a big presence, the general was invited to personal meetings with two presidents, with President McKinley in 1898, and with President Teddy Roosevelt in 1903 and 1907. And he was given the singular honour of leading the opening prayer at the Senate. Whereas at home his energy in later years was much taken up with strenuous lobbying for his Rhodesia scheme to establish an overseas colony there. And so in 1908, we see the general in deep debate at the highest level of politics with Balfour, Lloyd George and the Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. But the Rhodesia scheme was too ambitious by half and opposed by the Prime Minister of South Africa. It never happened. For this particular vision, the general had aimed too high. General Booth was as prepared to debate with the most powerful and wealthy about the state of their souls as with a dustman. He was utterly fearless. Let's take Winston Churchill as an example. He lobbied Winston several times as Home Secretary and got to know him sufficiently well to send him a message of good wishes on his marriage to Clemmy. The last recorded meeting was in 1910 when the general wanted the government to allow the army to hold weekly private meetings with prisoners who had converted to Christianity. This is how a long conversation with Winston ended. A Winston with a smile. Am I converted? Booth. No, I'm afraid you are not converted, but I think you are convicted. Winston. General Booth, I think you can see what is in me. Booth, what I am most concerned about is not what is in you at the present, but what I can see of the possibilities of the future. General Booth later said that it was one of the most interesting interviews of my life. What prescience in view of what we know happened to Churchill in his old age. We now move on to May 1912 in a packed Royal Albert Hall to mark the grand old man's 83rd birthday. He made a speech which ended on this stirring note. While women weep as they do now, I'll fight 
While little children go hungry as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison in and out, in and out, I'll fight. While there is a drunkard left, while there is a poor girl lost upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. I'll fight to the very end. This is fine rhetoric, which resonates with Churchill's We Will Fight on the Beaches speech in 1940. I wonder, might there be a connection? We must not forget the setbacks. The general was a man of joys and sorrows. He never recovered from the loss of his beloved wife. He lost his daughter, Eva, who headed up the army in the United States in a terrible train accident. He became estranged from three of his children, Kate, Billington and Herbert, who resigned the army. It was a lonely place at the top. To cap it all, the general progressively lost his eyesight with a one eye operation in 1909 and another in 1912, both at Rookstone, where an operating theatre was put together. But by June 1912, he was blind and he sank into oblivion. This is the last unfinished portrait by John McClure Hamilton, a day or two before General Boo's last illness. How the artist captures a wistfulness, a weariness. The General's work done. He's ready to move on. After his disastrous eye operation, William Booth hung on to life, drifting in and out of consciousness for almost two months. And after the dramatic storm over Hadley Wood on the 20th of August 1912, he died at 10.13 in the evening. Here we see the Salvation Army flag which William Booth had carried up Mount Calvary in Jerusalem, hanging over his bed. It is said that the roads lining the streets of London at his funeral were double the size of those drawn to the funeral procession of Diana, Princess of Wales. Among the 40,000 mourners in Olympia were thieves, tramps, harlots, the lost and the outcast to whom Booth had given his heart. A rumour went round the East End afterwards, never officially denied, that sitting at the rear of the hall incognito was none other than Queen Mary, and that Queen Alexandra followed the funeral procession in mourning weeds. And so the general passed into folklore. Tributes poured in from the national press and all over the world. The New York Times. No man of his time did more for the benefit of the people than William Booth. In the centre, here we see the headstone at Abney Park Cemetery, Stoke Newington, where William is buried next to his beloved Catherine. On the right, his monument in Westminster Abbey, commissioned in 1965, and on the left, the William Booth Training College in Denmark Hill, designed by Sir Gilbert Scott and opened in 1929 by Prince George. Rookstone became a place of pilgrimage. A visitor's book bearing thousands of signatures from all over the world was kept there. On the back of this memorial card was written, We had a nice time here. There were 36 in the party, saw practically all the late general's belongings and also went in the present general's garden. Signed, Hilda. The present general was Banwell, who succeeded his father. Here is another later memorial card showing the blue plaque. What motivated William Booth? It was having a personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus and the certain knowledge that he had been saved by his crucified Lord. It was also knowing that to serve Jesus meant having a passion to save the souls of others. He knew that this was impossible without the grace of God. By grace alone was William saved at the age of 15, and by God's grace alone would others be saved. Also that it was impossible to preach the good news to men and women who were struggling desperately to keep alive. So William Booth arrived at a simple conclusion recorded in an interview given in Hadley Wood. 
to help the poor, to minister to them in the slums, to sympathise with them in their poverty, afflictions and irreligion, was the most natural outcome of the life that came into my soul through believing in Jesus Christ. Here's another quotation from the General. God loves with a great love the one whose heart is bursting with a passion for the impossible. So William Booth placed all his trust in the Lord Jesus to make the impossible happen. He relied on what Jesus achieved on the cross by dying for his sins. In doing so, William Booth left the world an amazing legacy. He laid the foundations of an army which now operates in 126 countries and is the largest provider of social care in the UK after the government, influencing for good the lives of countless millions. He has also left us a record of his passion for God, the driving force behind everything he did. I cannot think of another man from the Victorian or Edwardian eras who loved his fellow man with more passion or compassion in the service of his Lord than William Booth, God's general. The last words belong to the general. I am glad you are enjoying yourself. The Salvationist is the friend of happiness. Making heaven on earth is our business. Serve the Lord with gladness is one of our favorite mottoes. So I am pleased that you are pleased. But amidst all your joys, don't forget the sons and daughters of misery. Do you ever visit them? Come away and let us make a call or two. Here is a home, fixed in family. They eat and drink and sleep and sit and die in the same chamber. Here is a drunken novel, void of furniture, wife of skeleton. Children in rags, father maltreating the victims of his neglect. Here are the unemployed, wandering about seeking work and finding none. Yonder are the wretched criminals, cradled in crime, passing in and out of the prison all the time. There are the daughters of shame, deceived and wronged and ruined. Travelling down the dark inclined to an early grave. There are the children fighting in the gutters, going hungry to school, going up to fill their parents' places. Brought it all on themselves, do you say? Perhaps so. But that does not excuse our assisting them. You don't demand a certificate of virtue before you drag the drowning creature out of the water not the assurance that a man has paid his rent before you deliver him from the burning building. But what shall we do? Content ourselves by singing a hymn, offering a prayer, or giving a little good advice? No. Ten thousand times no. We will pity them, feed them, reclaim them, employ them. Perhaps we shall fail with many, quite likely. But our business is to help them all the same, and that in the most practical, economical, and Christ-like manner. So let us hate to the rescue, for the sake of our own peace, the poor wretches themselves, the innocent children, and the Savior of us all. The you must help with the means, and as there is nothing like the present, who in this company will lend a hand? I wish to thank those named in these credits, but especially to give thanks to God for changing the life of William Booth, for making our nation more caring for the poor, the sick and the needy, and above all for giving us the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and what he came to do, to save sinners by dying on a cross and then rising victorious on that first Easter Sunday. The Hendon Band of the Salvation Army will conclude by playing Now Thank We All Our God.